Hello there, folks. Welcome to this new edition of Tomaski Cast from New Republic Video. I'm Michael Tomaski. I'm the editor of the New Republic, and I am joined today by Democratic pollster Cornell Belcher. Cornell, hi. How are you? Well, you know, uh, nervous and, uh, you know, confused. Uh, so, uh, I, <laughs> as we all are, but I want yeah, you to Yeah, get help. in line. Yeah. Get in line. It's a long line. Yeah, sure is. But maybe you can help us out. So, so let's get started here. So, uh, the election was a week ago, um, last Tuesday. And, uh, you know, uh, first of all, you were quoted in the New Republic uh, in a piece that ran last Tuesday morning by our reporter, Daniel Strauss, uh, the headline on which was, uh, if Terry McAuliffe loses, hit the, excuse me, folks, fucking panic button. Uh, <laughs> so uh, with a, week hinds a week's worth of hindsight, um, is it still panic button time in Democratic Party land? Yes, but but I, I mean that to say, um, to, to really uh, turn up a sense of urgency. Yeah. Um, and you know there are a lot of hot takes, but look, I'm I'm a I'm a pollster and a student of of politics and history, and and why I say hit the panic button is because we have to fundamentally change the dynamics going into this midterm session. Yeah. And if we don't change the fundamental dynamics going into this midterm session, history tells us what's going to happen. And the there's a lot of hot takes a, a, around what just happened um, in, this, in these off-year uh, gubernatorial elections and some of the down-battle elections. But truth of the matter is, um, there is nothing surprising or out of the ordinary uh, about what just happened. In fact, history tells us that this happened and history has been fairly consistent. Yeah. You know, whether it be Clinton or, 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 or Obama and now Biden, or and and actually, and, and the same goes for the, on the reverse side. Whether it be whether it be Bush one, Bush two, or or Trump, um, and I think sort of part of what we get caught up in is the moment. And Americans have a broadly have a have a awful way with history, uh, and we're like, uh, and and from election to election, uh, we seem to have amnesia. Um, but there is nothing. There was nothing not predictable about what happened uh, this past time because it is in fact a an occurrence that we that history tells us is going to happen and it, it continues to happen unless we change the fundamental dynamic yeah. and the changing the fundamental dynamic is bigger than just passing a one piece of legislation and I think yeah. part of the hot take from this past uh, election cycle is that you know you know somehow. Biden and Pelosi and, and the current round of Democrats are, there's something intrinsically uh, problematic about them that causes this, this result. And it's not because histor historically, this is what in fact happens. So the question for me is how do you fundamentally change the dynamic of a, of, of, of a midterm? And, and like I said, that's, that doesn't happen. Look, should we have, should they have passed build back better and, and an infrastructure uh, a month ago, yes, they, they could have and should have. Um, would it have made a better and create a better environment if they were out there selling it for de for for Democrats? Absolutely, it would. Mm -hmm. Would it have fundamentally changed the dynamic of this of this of of this of this cycle? No. Right. Um, let me let me think... let me just jump in. I mean, I want to talk about changing the dynamic because that's the important thing. So I want to move to that. But I want to do just another minute on Virginia postmortem. So of the of the reasons that uh, we've all seen listed for McAuliffe's defeat, <clears throat> critical race theory, the broader question of school closings during the pandemics and what the effect that had on parents, McAuliffe incessantly invoking Trump, McAuliffe's malapropism at that debate. Youngkin being seeming to most people like an inoffensive guy and whatever else. How do you rank those, those factors? I think there's the forest and the trees. And I'm gonna and I'm gonna circle right back around to my to to my to my fundamental proposition. Yeah. Is it can be, you know, uh, there there are changing variables, but the fundamental equation is still the same. Um, 
And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is if you look at, you know, look at the share of the suburban, uh, the share of the suburban vote, um, uh, this this election from the last election that happened, the share of the suburban vote was down as a proportion of the electorate was down, um, uh, you know, four or five points, and maybe maybe more off the top of my head. The share of the of the of the city, sort of the urban area, big city electorate. Uh, down as a share of, you know, uh, six or seven points, I, I, I believe, especially when you look at high concentration urban area, high concentration African American urban, urban areas, and then the rural vote was up four or five points, right? Mm -hmm. So you, and, and, and if you look at the college, non-college share of the electorate from, from, from this time around, from this election, from the last election, um, you know, uh, that share of that share of of the vote um, uh, also 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 changes, right? So, and 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 that's a pattern that we see, regardless of the of of the variable, the issue variables. That's a pattern that we see consistently in these off year elections, whether it be Clinton, whether it be oh, whether it be whether it be Obama, and now Biden. So yeah, I know we all would sort of the hot take again. It is, it was this. It was CRT, or it was, you know, um, or it was we didn't pass Build Back Better. I I want our viewers, especially you know people who 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 tune in to this. I, I think it was important sort of not to look and see beyond the hot take and actually ed, sort of do an educational piece because those trends and this is not sexy because it's not a hot take. But those dynamics, regardless of what the variable CRT or whatever those other variables are, that is the same dynamic that's happening in all these elections. So it's something bigger happening, right? And that's about energy and mobilization. But I'll come back to that. Mm -hmm. But you asked about CRT or these, or these other issues. Look, CRT is also not a new dynamic, right? Sure. CRT is welfare queen. Yeah. CRT is defund the police. CRT is crosstown busing. CRT is they and they're invading us. There's an invasion at our borders, right? It's it's just the newest evolution, and and quite frankly, a more eloquent evolution of that same classic racist dog whistle, born out of the Southern strategy, which we have to acknowledge and understand. The Southern strategy is still in effect, and it is the most successful political strategy in American history. Um, and what CRT is, 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 is another way to feed energy to mobilize um, a group of voters on, on the right. And it's, and it's the same thing as fundamentally as the big, what the big lie is. Because also understand the big lie is about something being taken, right? Those people are are stealing our country, and they're literally stealing elections from us, right? It's the same politics of 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 of, of aversion and 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 victimization and a, and racial a grievance. That's not new. It's just an ev evolution of it, and well, we pretend how, that. Yeah. How do Democrats yeah. answer this manifestation of it? Well, the question is, what if Democrats will answer this, man answer this manifestation? Because I ask you, Michael, <laughs> when have Democrats ever done a good job of answering the manifest, answering it? Right. So for me, it is, and I think, and look, I think, I think Republicans and those those on the right, they get race and they get tribalism. Uh, they get that 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 race and tribalism is is arguably one of the easiest ways to to divide and, and polarize and mobilize a, a, an, an electorate. Uh, progressives far too often, um, and why I say that, you know, I sort of white liberals, particularly white liberals uh, in the Northeast corridor who dominate so much of our, our politics on the, on the left, um, they wanna pretend that race doesn't matter and they wanna make up every excuse for race. Uh, oh, it's economic angst. Oh, it's classism. It's all these other things, and sure, some of that can can have a can can be a variable in it. But but 
But Republicans still fundamentally understand that it is tribal and and that's and and that's why they keep evolving the evolving the dog involving the dog whistle. So the question really is, Michael, not how Democrats respond to it, but if Democrats in fact respond to it at all, because there is a large swath of of thought and and sort of Democrat circles right now is that the the best thing still to do is basically to ignore it. Yeah. It is to say that, you know, if that's not true and then pivot to something else. And I think I think we are wearing blinders and, and it and it and it's really problematic uh, when the, when the other side said they're going to make this the central issue of the of their debate, which. You know, critical CRT was a critical was was a central sort of critical issue of, of about happening in Virginia. So they made a so they made a racial dog whistle the critical and central uh, yeah. uh, part of their their conversation. And, and our answer is okay, it's not true, and then pivot. I I just think strategically that's 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 problematic. Mm. So. Okay, so we shouldn't say that's not true and pivot to something else, or Democrats shouldn't rather. So, so you're saying Democrats need to respond directly to that sort of thing? If we were attacked on on any other policy, on any other su- space or subject matter, yeah, would our response be to say, "Well, that's just not true," and then pivot to talk to an- about, an- about something else? No, mm. it wouldn't be because because uh, that would be absurd. Right. Uh, but why is it about race, about issues of race? Is it that we want to simply change the subject as quickly as possible? Look, when Donald Trump stood up in his rallies, as he did in 16 and in the 2020, and he said, I'm going to give you back your country. And even before that, when Obama was elected, and and you had the rise of the Tea Party that said we got to take back our country. When people say they're losing their country, they got to take back their country. We should actually understand that what they're saying and actually take them at face value. That they think they're losing their country and they take back and, and we got to take back their country. Yeah. And so, to people who have who think that they are in fact losing something because another group may be gaining something. Our conversation, our conversation to them is when Donald Trump says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you back your country because you're losing your country and they're stealing your country. Our pivot is uh, we're gonna raise the minimum wage. I mean, yeah. how in the hell does that make any sense strategically? Right? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think Democrats should openly and proudly be the party of multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy. But what's the language? You know? Well. <laughs> Well, I get paid to, to answer questions like that. <laughs> okay. So I'm not going to give the language is. Uh, and and look, I, my 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 thing to Mike would be, uh, look, I don't know exactly what the language is, but I know it's not very heads in the sand. I would say I would say I would say this: the it's a it's it's about even pivoting and taking it and taking on the fight, which I'm saying that Democrats are too often not even taking on the fight. Because I think there is an answer. I think the, the response to to the ideal that 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 you're losing your country and these people are are taking your country away from you, they're stealing something from you. I don't know, maybe I'm crazy, but maybe it's something like uh you know um we're all in this together, right? And and America is not going to get wider. We're only going to continue to be more diverse. And in order for us to win the future and actually compete with China and India and the rising Asian uh, Pacific um, Asia, the rising uh, but, uh, Asian Pacific marketplace, is for us to come together, work together, and compete and win. Right. And that's about all of us and all of our children. I don't well, know. That, yeah. Maybe somewhere in that space is, right. a, is a beginning to a conversation to, to, to even answer that. But he or she who dominates, who defines the debate, you know, as politics 101, they're going to win the debate. If, in fact, you know, it's it's one of my favorite lines from, from the movie Malcolm X, uh, you know, where Elijah Muhammad's talking to Malcolm. It's, it's like if, if, if the people are thirsty and you give them this dirty water, they will drink it. Yeah, right. 
if you get, if you don't give them an alternative to it. So I'm simply asking, we should fully embrace an alternative um, conversation in that space as opposed to trying to pivot out of it. Yeah. So let's talk now about 2022 and, and this fundamental dynamic that you mentioned. Um, what kind of dynamic do the Democrats need to create to have a prayer of holding on to the House? Here is the, he, you know, here is the good news that although it's not worth anything, there are more voters on the left than there are voters on the right nationally. Mm -hmm. There are, without question. Uh, even when they have a tremendous surge, which they, which they did uh, in 2020, you know, in, in the end, uh, <laughs> Biden won a solid majority, man, <laughs> right? It was a solid majority, um, you know, over 7 million more votes. There are more voters, uh, you know, and again, coming off the back-to-back -to -back, uh, majority victories by Barack Obama. When was the last time a Republican won a, a majority? Nonetheless, when was the last time a Republican won back-to-back -back majorities, right? There, mm -hmm. there, it's just a math. There are absolutely more, more voters open to us than there are open to Republicans sort of on our side. The question is, the question is, again, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't rocket science. It is enthusiasm and motivation matters. And tell me, tell me what, tell me what the, tell me what issue, what policy item, uh, you know, Republicans are running on. What policy item are Republicans putting out here? You know, what what ten point policy prescription for America are Republicans running on? They're not. Right. They are feeding their their base red meat, and they are and this again is is one hundred and one. The big lie and all of that is about mobilization, that they can energizing and then they can mobilize and organize around, and they are mobilized and they're organized. So what are Democrats organized? What are Democrats mobilized about, right? And and again, we've got to change that fundamental dynamic. And and this is the hard part, Michael, because because I say this out loud, and 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 people want to say, you know, I'm I'm poo pooing it, but I'm not poo pooing it. Right. Build back better and infrastructure are really, really important big pieces of legislation and they're really good govern governance. But are those young people who who left the streets marching and protesting for for equality and justice and who marched on the polls and changed the face of this election and gave Democrats their power? Are they are are they marching and mobilizing for broadband and bridges? Right. Although they like they want broadband right, and bridges, right. okay. It's not I'll, a mobilizing I'll, thing. I'll take a stab at uh, red meat for the Democratic base for 2022, and this flies a little bit in the face of conventional wisdom because Terry McAuliffe did such a bad job of trying to tie Youngkin to Trump. But I think it's about Trump, and I think it's about you know if they take back the House. They're probably going to try to impeach Joe Biden. They're going to, you know, they're going to be in a position to help Trump steal the election in 2024. You know, Trump's going to run. You know, Trump's going to be the nominee. And if there's a, another narrow Biden win, they are going to steal it next time. Don't set that in motion, people. Don't let it set in motion. Is that a good ar argument? I, w I, I wish you I wish you were in charge of the park. Uh, <laughs> But I, I would modify it. I would modify. I would think about modifying that just a little bit. Yeah. Because, because how about this? How about saving democracy? Yeah. Right. Which is actually boils down to the sort of point that you're making. The broad. This is a simpler point that you're making is democracy is literally on the ballot this time around, right? Because all those things that you just talked about, those things are going to happen if these people come back to power, right? These, if this Trump cult comes back to power. So I'm not, so Trump for me, doesn't have to be the central piece of it. I think he's, I think he's a, I think he's a variable in that conversation, but I think the central piece of it is, and this is something that perhaps, again, if the other side is, is mobilize, mobilizing around the idea of taking away freedom and democracy, can't we mobilize around the ideal of, of, of saving democracy and freedom, and we, we be the party, we, we be the, the party for America that's for freedom and democracy. I got an idea. How about, how about let's build a bridge, let's build more bridges and save democracy. Yeah. Crazy? Yeah. 
So I think you, I, I think you're, I think you're spot on. Well, uh, yeah, you know, I, I like it. You like it. Uh, now all we have to do is <laughs> convince <laughs> congressional Democrats to use it, which, you know, I picture them kind of saying, oh, no, we don't want to go there for some reason or another. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. They, 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 they will they stick to the safe ground of, of policy accomplishment, which I know, you know, people agree with them on their policy accomplishments by yeah. and large. But, you know, that's not, as you say, it's not inspiring. It's It's not it doesn't create passionate response. Well, and it doesn't, it's not going to change the dynamic. Yeah. It's not, not fun. Look, you know, say what you will, but in 08, Obama moved a, a set of policies and an agenda that literally pulled this country back from the from the cliff of 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 economic disaster and ruin. You know. Uh, whether it be GM or the financial set, you you talk about it like, and 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 put the country back on a course of economic growth and 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 again solid policies. Right now, the economy is growing. Right, Biden's job numbers are fantastic, particularly in that, particularly with with the idea that we're in a pandemic. We have people vaccinated again. We actually have a vaccination rollout again. We're on the world stage again where countries are respecting us again. We have the rollout of perhaps the most important sort of investment in, in, in the environment of our lifetime. We're having, an, we're having investments in the infrastructure of our country uh, that's, that's the largest we've ever had in our lifetimes, right? Yeah. And, and again, the economy is, the economy is actually doing doing well when you look at all the all the other numbers and again but is any of that going to fundamentally change the dynamic is this transactional argument going to fundamentally change the dynamic for me one of the biggest sort of conflicts that i have with the establishment and particularly sort of this east coast conventional uh northeast corridor um establishment thinking is it goes something like this I'm going to give you some money. I'm going to save you some money so you vote for me. <laughs> right? Yeah. I'm going to give you a tax credit so you vote for me, right? It's also goddamn transactional. And we know in the real world, Michael, that so many of these people who live out in the middle of America, they're not making, you know, they don't live their lives on transactions, right? They make sense of their lives through the prism of their of their values and their religiosity and their beliefs. Yeah. And we're just trying to, and, and, and we're so goddamn transactional. Um, again, it, it, we want voters to think like we think that if in fact I give you this pocketbook transaction, you are then going to vote for me. Yeah. All right. And we keep one, I mean, if there is a belief of, of progressives, it is that. It is that. It is this. It is this belief in the pocketbook transaction, and I think that belief sometimes takes us too far astray. And again, it is. It is. Is it rational? Yes. But it's one thing. Like one of my 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 mentors, rest his soul, used to tell me when I was a young political buck coming up, is Bill Lynch used to say to me, um, the great Harlem Fox, Bill Lynch used to say to me, Cornell, you're you're being too rational, mm. and as I grew older, I began to understand what he means by uh, sometimes you're being too you're being too you're being too rational. Yeah, Bill was my friend too. Incidentally, he's a great man. Yes, he great, was great man. Last question, then I'll let you go. Um, you, you, are you still optimistic about the country's future? Or are you scared to death? Where on that scale would you put yourself? Okay, this is a really serious because, and, and I don't say this lightly, um, democracy isn't guaranteed here, right? It's an experiment. And, and relative to other countries, we actually haven't even been around that long. And people, people need to understand that democracy can fail here. It has failed in, in other places. We can, in fact, we can, in fact, swing to tyranny and authoritarianism. It has happened in, in, in other westernized, Western industrial countries. I mean, 
Germany was one of the best educated countries on the face of the planet at the time that fascist rose. Yeah. Um, if, 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 these state, if what these state legislative bodies are doing around disenfranchising voters and even furthermore, uh, writing in the rules and laws that's gonna allow them to overturn an, an election, which they didn't have the ability really to do last time, but they'll have to do next time. We're gonna lose democracy. If, if, if they win, if, if Republicans win, it's the scenario you talked about, if Republicans win and what they're, what they're doing in state legislative bodies and then they'll be able to do it at the national level uh, stands, they will absolutely overthrow, overturn an election. And the moment they overturn an election, it all burns. All of this, all of this burns. And that scares the hell out of me because that is what we're facing because we're, you know, we're not changing the fundamental dynamics of, the, of this midterm election. So history tells us what's gonna happen. Yeah. And so all the, the stuff that the state legislative bodies are doing to overturn an election uh, and disenfranchise people, it will stand. And then they will disenfranchise people and they will overturn an election. And the moment they do that, all of this is gonna burn. Yeah, well, <clears throat> The common instinct is to try to end on, a, on an optimistic note, but you know, this is the real <laughs> note. So let's end on the real note and, yeah. and get people thinking. Cornell Belcher, thank you so much. Great conversation. Thank you for having me. I, I love what you're doing. Keep it up. Thank you. Appreciate it.